Hello, uh, standing before you today, we've got Jonathan, Emily, Josh, and Josh. Uh, as previously mentioned, the South Atlantic Anomaly, and our investigation is into the possible causes of it. Um, so, most of our research comes from Tim Peake um, on the ISS, um, we're from the Thomas Valley School in Dorset, and we did this at our CERN school project. Uh, so that's Tim Peake and that's the ISS. So the ISS, as you know, flying around the Earth, um, hit with a bunch of astronauts had five uh, uh, time picks chips with them and uh, in the Principia mission he was also taking uh, data of, uh, of, of radiation with those, with those chips and that's what we use uh, for our data. Um, uh, so we were lucky enough to be given one. I won't explain how it works because I'm sure you've heard enough about that already. Uh, so our school goes to Sir annually and we were given it uh, on one of those trips. Um, so yeah, the data we got given. So we were able to look at frame rate, um, energy per, per pixel, uh, altitude, longitude, latitude, anything else up there. Uh, and it's with it this information that we, we were able to carry out our research. So we started our project not knowing about the Saturn anomaly. So when Mike Grocock came to our school as part of an astrophysics uh, workshop, and the Emily spoke to us working on the CERN school project, uh, and he showed us some of the data from uh, the Tim Fix project, uh, and he showed us this, this hotspot, that um, a graph similar to this, where you can see the heightened levels of radiation at this latitude uh, between roughly minus 40 and minus 20. Uh, so we wondered uh, what could be causing it, we wanted to do our experiment on that. So we did an initial analysis of the data and we resulted with um, graphs similar to this. So we can see very clearly, uh, yes. uh, very clearly uh, the areas of the heightened radiation uh, coming off to an area off the South American coast. So having found this, we set up some aims, firstly to discover the cause of this uh, heightened level of radiation. Uh, and we initially considered that potentially ground level radiation could be affecting uh, what was detected on the International Space Station. Uh, beyond that, we considered altitude, ozone there, and then finally space weather. So we started looking at the ground radiation sources. We thought to look at areas of known ground level radiation uh, and then compare them to the radiation detected on the International Space Station about these areas. So we considered uh, southern England, which is where our school is situated, uh, Chernobyl, as after 1986 uh, um, accident, there would be high, more levels of nuclear fallout there, looking more radiation. And then finally, in Fukushima, after the 2011 earthquake, there were again a nuclear accident and more fallout radiation. So we uh, did research into what the ground level of radiation was here, and we found that at Fukushima, it's much uh, higher than the rest of them, uh, experiencing 15 microsieverts per hour. And then even trouble with the heightened level, it experiences much, much lower at 0.75, and then southern England 0.21. So then we looked at the information that was <coughs> detected by the International Space Station. Starting off with Chernobyl, uh, we can see a uniform distribution of data detected, but uh, looking at the histogram, the majority of the frame energies were recorded between 3,000 and 11,000 kilo electron volts, uh, averaging out at um, 10,500 kilo electron volts. So then uh, we move on to Fukushima, again a more uniform distribution, but this time between 1,000 and 6,000 um, with the majority of the frames, averaging out at uh, 3,800. Finally, uh, southern England, we see a less uniform distribution with more <coughs> spikes. But again, the histogram shows that the majority of the frames were between 3,000 and 11,000 electron volts, averaging at 11,000. So in southern England, we focus on Dorset, as this is where our school is from. And unfortunately, you can see that nothing interesting is going on in our school. But at much of the down, we do see two spikes in the data. Uh, so as in something, <coughs> radon gas causes the majority of the radiation we experience. So looking at a radon gas that we can compare the three areas um, to the, the, the data experienced on the space station. And we can see there isn't very much of a correlation. So moving on, we, we compared all our results. And just looking at the three areas, uh, here's the ground level radiation, here's radiation experience of the satellite. And you can see they are actually complete opposites. So uh, Fukushima, very high radiation on the ground, very low um, head on the space station, and then Chernobyl and southern England are actually uh, stopped over. When we then consider the hotspot, we notice that it completely has blow cell ones out the water. There's vastly more radiation there with no clear ground level sources. So from this, we can conclude that there is not a correlation between the ground level radiation and that experienced on the International Space Station. 
So moving on from our initial analysis of the TIMPIX data, we set up our own experiment using our TIMPIX device in school to test the inverse square law. We used a piece of uranium glass and decided to measure how pixel count changed with increased distance from the source. So the inverse square law, it says that for a point source, the intensity of the radiation is inversely proportional to the square of the distance from the source. So simply put, if you double your distance from the source, you have a quarter of your emission intensity. As you can see, we've seen the pixel one representations of the different types of radiation, and the three types vary depending on your radioactive isotope that you choose to use. Gamma is, has a radial nature, and so it does follow the inverse square law. However, alpha and beta don't because they're particles and they're slowed down by the air. In our investigation, we also had to deal with background radiation as we're not in a shielded room in the school laboratory. 15% of this is artificial, or comes from the nuclear industry and um, medical scans and so on. However, our chip would only have experienced 75% or whereabouts of the initial radiation that humans experience, as we don't, in some way, we don't get very near that near to a nuclear explanation. It has, our chip has not undergone any medical scans or anything, and as it's not a human, it doesn't have to be put during it, so it wouldn't ingest any way to have to that way, as a human would. The results of our experiment followed an inverse square pattern, which is similar to a negative exponential. We showed that after 0.6 metres, the level of radiation detected by the chip had fallen to about background level, and we can extrapolate this to the space station and say that although any ground-based sources would be of a higher intensity than our piece of uranium glass, at 400 kilometers altitude, it's incredibly unlikely that any ground-based radiation hotspots could be affecting our peaks detected from the tinting tip, data. So we can conclude saying that background radiation, radiation hotspots on Earth, are not causing the surface mountain anomaly. So you must remember this whole thing that we didn't know about the surface mountain anomaly before starting our experiment. Otherwise, this entire thing seemed rather uh, pointless. But um, so our next consideration was the altitude of the space station, uh, whether this would have an effect on the frame energy it detected. Uh, looking at all the data, we compared frame energy to altitude and found a correlation coefficient of 0 0.198. and So incredibly low, concluding there is no correlation between these things. Uh, so next we thought the ozone. The ozone there blocks um, <coughs> ultraviolet radiation entering our atmosphere. So it is conceivable that a weaker ozone there would allow more radiation through, therefore more could be detected. However, we immediately ran into problems as the ozone there um, is between 10 and 40 kilometres in altitude, whereas the space station orbits are around 400 kilometres. So any ozone impacts would be below um, the space station. Even if that wasn't the case, looking at the information uh, on the ozone, we found that over um, the area we were interested in, there was no decrease in the strength of the ozone there. So finally, we looked at the space weather. So Earth is constantly bombarded by radiation from space. Um, which looks at high, uh, which come from high level sources, uh, which is more local, such as solar flares or coronal mass ejections, or, no, sorry, low energy radiation comes from uh, these sources, or then high energy radiation <coughs> comes from more galactic events, such as supernova or um, supermassive black holes. So the Earth's magnetic field, caused by the rotating in a core, uh, this, this blocks the majority of this radiation and creates the Van Allen belts around the globe. Uh, and these hold the radioactive particles uh, in these belts, um, as you can see there. So then, uh, when in researching the space weather, we found the South African anomaly finally. Um, and this is an area over just off the coast of South America where there is the increased levels of radiation detected. This is due to a misalignment between the Earth's rotational axis and the Earth's magnetic axis, uh, resulting in a low point in the uh, Van Allen belts. Uh, where the magnetic field is weaker, so more radiation can uh, be let through. So we, when we compared our data to the um, South Atlantic anomaly data, we found these facts up exactly, uh, with the hotspot detected and the hotspot already recorded uh, being off the coast of South America, which is just a bit south of Brazil. Uh, when we did even closer analysis, we found that the um, areas of high radiation of the poles were also detected in our data, as we can see not only the hotspot, but also the increased um, radiation there. We also noted that the seeming cold spot we detected at Fukushima is further explained by this. As we can see, at um, uh, around 30 degrees latitude, there is less radiation detected. Uh, so Fukushima being at 35, 
and 37.75 latitude uh, would be in this sort of dip in radiation detectors. Um, so the importance of mapping the South Atlantic anomaly. Uh, as there is much higher levels of radiation there, it's very important that we know exactly where it is because uh, space stations and satellites actually have to turn off more sensitive equipment as they go through this area so they aren't damaged. Uh, so knowing exactly where this area is is very important. And what we found, uh, interestingly, was that the data we collected on the South Atlantic anomaly was actually not the same as the data were pre-recorded. So which suggests, along with other sources, that the location is actually the area is actually moving. Um, but however, our conclusion isn't perfect, as we did find some problems uh, with our hypothesis. So firstly, looking at other magnetic field sources, we found maps that showed the varying strengths of magnetic fields. So uh, this one, for example, these hot spots are actually um, higher levels of magnetic fields at the poles, not lower as we suspected, which will result in less radiation detected. Uh, furthermore, from our understanding of the South Atlantic anomaly, we would expect a, a similar hotspot on the other side of the Earth, which didn't show up in our data. So further explanation um, and further research that would be really interesting. Uh, so to conclude, we found um, an increased amount of radiation in an area off the South Atlantic coast, uh, south, um, off, off South America. Uh, after researching it, we found it extremely unlikely that this radiation is being caused by ground-based sources. Uh, and looking at the inverse square law, we see it is um, illogical to link these two, two things. Uh, next, we also uh, concluded that there's no correlation between the ozone layer strength or the altitude of the space station and the frame energy effects. Uh, looking more, the South Atlantic anomaly and the, the hot spot we detected do line up, so we can conclude that these have correlated and we can assume correlation as well. Uh, we found that the um, the, the data on the radiation of the poles also links to our data. Um, however, our conclusion isn't perfect due to um, uh, differing information on the magnetic poles and uh, a lack of understanding on the nature of the sound anomaly. So it's been presented by me, Jonathan and Emily, and as you can see, we've got two people standing there looking rather uh, uncomfortable. Uh, so Josh uh, is both of them, so I'll, just, I'll hand you over to Josh to explain why they haven't said anything throughout the presentation. Uh, well, last Wednesday we were invited to the Principia Conference in uh, Portsmouth to give this presentation. Um, Tim Peake himself was in attendance at the conference and we had the magnificent opportunity of um, showing him a couple of the slides that we've shown you uh, and showing him how we've used the data that he helps to collect in our research. There's a few thank yous uh, we need to make. So we, we did have a former student uh, who can't be here today because she's uh, at university. She helped a lot in sort of putting the data together uh, with Python. Um, uh, we also need to thank Mike Gokoff who really helped kick uh, our investigation off. We're well, thanks to the Cerner School for everything they've done. Um, and our staff who are here with us today and uh, all the crew of the ISS. Um, thank you.